Perseverance Award for being here um, and um, having faith in uh, Christine, who said that um, told me that she told the weather to behave. So um, the weather is behaving, and thank you for uh, joining me. So if you followed um, the news of the last 24 hours, Chris is giving me a signal. What would you like? Um, okay, I'm at the podium. Okay. Oh. Oh, that's going to cramp my style. All right. <laughs> um, they're video recording. I should have known better to stand here. So um, it, it will cramp my style, but I can adjust. I'm flexible. So if you followed the news of the last 24 hours, there's a lot of news going on. And the only one I'm going to reference is what's happening with the royal family. And the reason I mention that is, um, I believe this came from um, the now deceased um, Queen Mum, and she had a motto, never complain, never explain. Well, evidently the current generation isn't aware of that, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I, am, I have no complaints but I'm gonna offer a couple of explanations. So I would not fit in with the royal family either um, because I tend to explain. The first thing I wanna point out is um, there has been some incorrect titling on the program for today. So I just wanna make sure that everyone is aware that this is the program for today, Spark Cultural Programming for People with Memory Loss. I'm Lisa Hoffman, a curator of education at the Woodson Art Museum. That's explanation one. Explanation two, I used to teach um, at North Central Technical College in two different stints, and I taught many different courses. I'm comfortable in front of people. This is, this is comfortable to me. Even if Chris makes me stand in front of the podium, I am comfortable. And I've presented lectures 45 minutes long to four hours long on ethics. So when I was approached by Christine and Linda Haney, who's on the steering committee, and my uh, director at the Woodson Art Museum, Kathy Foley, about speaking at Good Ideas about Spark, absolutely, please, let me, let me present. It's about things that I am proud of and I enjoy, and it's very easy to speak on these topics, much easier than speaking on ethics for four hours. So I sat down with PowerPoint, pulled up the templates on PowerPoint and the template fonts, and I'm sitting at my Mac computer. I work at a visual art museum. The visuals are incredibly important to us, so I made sure that my presentation had many images, and everything is great. And if you know anything about me, and there's some faces here that I recognize, I have some vision issues. I have some issues I have to deal with. So I'm also very aware of font and font size. Chris and I run through my program and I discover that this font is way too small. So there's my second explanation. So when I flip through these, I will read some to you, read back, and I apologize. And that will be the first correction I will make when I get back. So. Prince Harry has stepped away from his role as a senior royal, and I do not have a chance at being a senior royal because I am explaining, and we're not supposed to explain. So having said that, I'm going to go into the presentation for today. Again, Lisa Hoffman, Curator of Education at the Lee Yockey Woodson Art Museum. Again, I was very pleased to be asked to be part of Great Ideas, excuse me, Good Ideas 2020. And just to tell you a little bit about myself, I gave you a bit of a background on my teaching. I am an educator. I teach from birth, oops, I'm gonna get hollered at, I'll step back here. I teach uh, from birth through second grade. There are two educators at the Woodson Art Museum. And my tasks are to work with birth through um, second grade, as well as those on the other end of the spectrum and um, special audiences. 
I am not an artist, nor am I an art historian. I am trained in sociology and comparative religious studies. That's a combination. Um, and what I like to think of is art and the stories that you can tell about art and the stories that you can share in a gallery with visitors. Having said that, I am here to speak about memory loss associated with dementia and Alzheimer's. I am not an expert in dementia or in Alzheimer's, but I am a staff lead on a program for those with memory loss and their care partners. So I'm coming here to share art, to share stories, and give you a brief overview of um, the science, where the science is at right now on dementia and Alzheimer's. But I do not want to present this as um, that I'm an expert in these areas. And the other thing that I'm going to be challenged with today is showing you how this origami butterfly and the hope that a butterfly um, symbolizes will um, fit in with our discussion of dementia and memory care. So we will come back to origami, and this will be the challenge. I think you will hold me to it. Make sure that I circle back around and talk about my origami butterfly. So, I chose um, not a very inspired image, but an image of a light bulb for the uh, Good Ideas 2020. What do you think of when you look at this light bulb? You think of luminescence. You think of brightness, sunshine. Good Ideas, the conference itself, is about rejuvenation, refreshment. We are sitting at the very last session of the conference, and the topic, memory loss, dementia, Alzheimer's. The statistics are provided by a slide from the Alzheimer's Association, and again, um, they're illegible, but that's all right, um, because I wasn't going to go through the statistics, because the statistics are daunting. We need to go back to this luminescence and this brightness. If we look at the statistics, as I said, they are quite daunting, and often it will reference genetic risk factors. And the research right now um, there isn't a talk of a cure or a fix. It's talking about slowing progression and delaying the expression. We need this luminescence. So what I'm here to talk about today is the people, the humans that are impacted by memory loss in our community and ways to find joy through art for those that are dealing with memory loss. Perhaps not surprisingly, I'm going to talk about the influence of art and dementia. And for those, just for a quick background, dementia is the umbrella term, and under there, many different diseases fit under the umbrella term of dementia, Alzheimer's being one of them, and some of the research that I'll be referencing will deal directly with Alzheimer's, but the program that I'm um, discussing at the Woodson Art Museum is for those with memory loss, for any reason. This is a piece that is currently in our galleries. It's called Together by Eric Domain and Martin Domain, an origami piece. And we will circle back to Eric Domain later on because not only is he one of the most renowned origami artists in the world, he is also a PhD at MIT. 
and is leading the way in um, uh, Alzheimer's research, interestingly enough. The obvious connection between art and dementia is experiences in an art gallery, in an art museum, or creating art, and the increasing of quality of life through creativity, through a cultural experience, through the community, and through improvisation. I mentioned that um, my background is in sociology, so what I refer to as a softer science. But we also have hard science involved um, in the connection of uh, intersection, excuse me, of art and origami. And I will reference that in a minute. We have a rocket scientist who has his work um, on view at the Woodson Art Museum. His name is Robert Lang. He has a PhD out of Caltech, worked for NASA, worked on some super secret things with NASA, then retired to become a full-time origami artist. We are very pleased to say that he will be in residence at the Woodson Art Museum over the weekend of February 22nd and 23rd. So that is referenced in here. I don't think it is, you can find a much harder science than rocket science. But there are also soft sciences, the social sciences involved, and one of them is the work of um, Dr. Lucan at the University, at Miami University in Ohio, and I had the privilege of listening to her speak about her work. She has a program called Opening Minds Through Art, and the acronym is OMA, which in some cultures means grandma, and that's um, intentional. So um, she is working on an intergenerational art program for people with dementia. She describes her program as building bridges across age and cognitive barriers through art. What she wants to measure and has measured is the changes in attitude in young adults, the change in attitude towards dementia as they experience art with those with advanced Alzheimer's. Now I want to point out that this is science. She uses the scientific method and has come up with this amazing research through um, her studies in this program. And what she does is pairs, she's at a university, so she pairs mostly um, young college students. She does work with some high school students in the area, but mainly um, college students. Puts them through a training program, and then they go into the community and work with those with advanced Alzheimer's and create art together. And the idea is that I might have a preconceived idea about you, and you might have a preconceived idea about me, and if we're going to carry on a conversation, it's going to start with, how long have you been at Spark, you know, et cetera, where are you from? And about three or four questions in, you're done. But if there's a third thing that you're doing, whether it's a jigsaw puzzle or something else, the conversation, the connections can continue. And so the college student and the other participant work on art projects. And these are because, again, this is, she uses the scientific method. She has prescribed art projects that they're working on. And she measures the attitudes of the young adults going into this program and then the attitudes on the end of this program to see how they've changed. I'm presenting this material today and telling you that I'm talking about luminescence and brightness so I can tell you that, yes, indeed, it does change attitudes towards the positive. Another very interesting thing that has come out of her research is she's discovered that, and again, she's dealing with advanced Alzheimer's in patients, and she's discovered that in the advanced stages, they can quantify and measure that empathy increases which is fascinating. And again, this is, the science is not my strong suit, but there's a very classic um, 
test that's done, experiment that was run in developmental psychology where they have the baby crossing plexiglass and it looks like the bottom is going to drop out and if there is a loved one on the other end making eye contact, that baby will cross that barrier because they trust the person on the other end. And so they've done similar studies with people in advanced Alzheimer's and have discovered that um, empathy increases. So the ability to read the emotions coming off of someone else increases as you advance into Alzheimer's. So it's very interesting because I think often, as I pointed out on my earlier slide, when you talk about Alzheimer's and dementia and memory loss, it seems like loss, every step is loss. And what's interesting is at least we're getting some clues into a, a potentially positive change that occurs. That isn't to spin it as a, as a positive situation, but to see that there are also some um, positive changes that occur. But can you think of what some of the challenges might be if in advanced Alzheimer's empathy increases? Can you imagine what a challenge or a negative that could come out of that. If you have a stressed care partner, that person with Alzheimer's is gonna pick up on that stress even more. And so that is the challenge then too when working with professional caregivers and care partners is a recognition that that empathy does increase. Reading those social cues actually increases. So the focus on the care partner and the care partner needing respite is also part of what I will talk about in a moment. We are in the year 2020, which is great when you work at a visual art museum because you can um, do the word play of 2020 and being able to see things more clearly. And I'll have to tell you that even on my computer screen, the visual, the graphic that I could use for this, you couldn't read that art chart. <laughs> it was fuzzy. Um, so um, that's a little a bit of a challenge. But there is our eye chart and the idea of um, seeing things more clearly in 2020, which brings us to the focus on research right now in um, Alzheimer's and dementia. Again, we talk about these genetic risk factors, and so the focus now is shifting somewhat to what's called epigenetics, which is the study of changes in organisms caused by modification of gene expression rather than alteration of the genetic code itself. So give that statement to me, and the way I spin that and spit that back out is essentially what they're trying to do is um, change how this gene is expressed. And that's where a lot of the focus is um, right now. And as part of that, they talk a lot about delaying, as I mentioned earlier, slowing the progression. And what they've come up with, which is really interesting, because I will tell you that next month I will be 52 years of age. And so I'm listening to this and I'm like, oh, why does it always go back to this? So what have they discovered about possibly slowing the progression or delaying the expression? Exercise. 20 minutes of um, cardio a day um, to the point where you do the talk test, you know, where you're struggling just a little bit to talk. So 20 minutes of cardio, diet. A nice balanced diet. There's something called the MIND, M-I-N-D diet um, through Rush University that they're recommending. They also recommend um, cognitive challenges. Do something that you find challenging. And what they've discovered, which I find also very interesting because um, the person that was presenting at the last conference I was at did a lovely job. She said, you know, if you don't like Sudoku, don't put yourself through Sudoku. You know, find something that you enjoy. But the other catch to this is they've discovered that you need to find something that challenges you enough that it pushes you to the frustration level. 
So um, they find that that is very healthy for the brain. And again, I'm not going to speak to that. This was a neuropsychologist that was presenting it, and I'm not going to pretend to be a neuropsychologist. But they find that if you find something that takes you just a little bit to the frustration level and you need to stop and think and reassess, that that's actually very good um, for brain health. And then the other key component is social engagement. Um, social isolation combined with genetic risk factors is an awful combination when we deal with dementia and Alzheimer's. You need social engagement. And that's where we're going to bring this around to the Liaki Woodson Art Museum and the program at the Liaki Woodson Art Museum called SPARK. I want to give you just a brief background on the Liaki Woodson Art Museum and before I mention the program itself. The Liaki Woodson Art Museum is known worldwide for setting the standard for avian art. Um, Birds and art occurs every fall and this year we will celebrate our 45th birds in art. And again, we set the standard internationally for avian art. This is a piece called Esperanto, and it was in our 2017 Birds in Art by an artist named Laurent Senois. And this is the white peacock pigeon. We had a lot of fun with this one in our Spark program. We played some flamenco music and we had some white fans that we used and um, had a lot of fun with this particular artwork. Art ignites creativity and fuels imagination. The always admission-free and barrier-free Woodson Art Museum serves all visitors. And what I'd like to point out is the image on the uh, right, that is master artist Don Rombat. He was named master wildlife artist in 2017. And he is sharing the art of, that he created called Actively Waiting. It's a sculpture of a, a magnificent bird of paradise. And he wanted that magnificent on there. And it's a bronze, stainless steel, and brass sculpture. The reason I wanted to point this out is the women that are gathered with Don at his artwork are participants in a program called Art Beyond Sight. And again, we are barrier free. The Art Beyond Sight program began in 2006. And once during every exhibition on a Saturday before public hours, we meet with individuals with low vision and blindness and share art. So we um, have permission from the artists to touch certain works. And we also bring in tactiles and discuss artwork. In this particular image, this is one of my favorites and has become a talking point for our program. Um, because what was occurring there is they're interacting with this piece and discussing the artwork, and it's an image of a bird, and they're feeling it, and you can see the ages, the approximate ages of the women involved, and one of them turned to Don and said, birds have feet? And if you stop and think about it, if you give a visual description of a bird, or you read a story about a bird, you're talking about wings, and beaks, and flight, and how often are feet referenced? And so that was just a beautiful moment. And then it went on, Don went on to describe how um, the ornithologists in the 1700s and 1800s, when they were shipping uh, pieces back and forth, they really didn't have a way of preserving the feet. So there was sort of this mythology that birds didn't have feet, because then when they were swapping specimens back and forth across the ocean, many of the feet didn't survive the process. So he said there was actually some mythology um, involving the birds, too. That's what I love about art museum engagement. It starts with something seemingly as simple as touching a bronze sculpture, and then the conversation just takes off. 
and that's what I really enjoy about programs at the Woodson Art Museum and sharing art with others. We are also a dementia-friendly organization. We were one of the first in the community to be trained to be dementia-friendly in 2017, again, as part of the Barrier Free. Today, specifically, I'm talking about the SPARC program. SPARC is a cultural program for people with memory loss and their partners. The inception of SPARC began with a grant from the Helen Bader Foundation in 2009. SPARC was originally inspired by the Meet Me at MoMA program, a successful outreach effort at New York's Museum of Modern Art, and has continued to grow and foster engagement activities using sensory stimulants combined with visual art conversations, music, poetry, hands-on art making, movement, and creative performances. Woodson Art Museum's SPARC program is generously supported by Abby Spire in memory of Dr. Lyman J. Spire. So had I used the correct font with a nice crisp uh, color to it, I would have just left that and not read that. And in the meantime, I would have told you a little bit more about what distinguishes the Woodson Art Museum SPARC program. So this is how it began. Again, to think of the Woodson Art Museum in this community, a community this size, and how progressive this um, art museum is. And I want to thank many of you and all of you in the, in the uh, auditorium that support the Woodson Art Museum. And I know we have supporters here. And um, thank you so much for everything that you do for our community museum. And we were the first museum to be trained by MoMA in how to create a SPARC program. That's incredible to think that um, the museum in Wausau, Wisconsin was trained um, by MoMA in presenting a SPARC program. So we've been doing SPARC since um, 2010, one of the firsts. So uh, the other part that I wanted to speak to you about is um, this is a part of my job. I'm staff lead on the SPARC program. It's a part of my job. I'm not a dementia specialist. This is not what I do eight hours a day. It's one of the programs. So I referenced in the calendar of events the rocket scientist that's coming to speak and present and offer workshops. And then if you look at this one, it also tells you um, some of the exhibitions that are coming. And if you open it up, it shows you the programs that are offered at the Woodson Art Museum for all ages and stages. We offer a wide variety of programs. So this is what happens, occurs at the Woodson Art Museum. So today I have this presentation in the afternoon that I'm looking forward to. And in the morning, I trained a new volunteer, which again, we are so <coughs> blessed at the Woodson Art Museum to have a volunteer core over a hundred strong and growing every day. And um, this morning was also a spark experience at the museum, just happened to coincide beautifully. This is important to me for a couple of reasons. So OMA began the program. There are now 22 other um, cultural organizations throughout the United States that are doing spark programs, including the Woodson Art Museum. We are unique in many regards. One of them is we are volunteer run. In many of the organizations, the staff person leads the experience. I develop the program, and then I have the pleasure of turning it over to our volunteers with their amazing experiences and their a professional backgrounds and the compassion that they bring to the program, and they bring the joy to the program. And most of the participants would have no idea who I am, and that is just perfect, because we are volunteer run, which is a beautiful thing. Another um, component that distinguishes the Woodson Art Museum is every month is a new program, where at many uh, cultural institutions, they rely on their collections and sort of have more canned programs. We again have the commitment of our volunteers to learn new programs on a monthly basis. Something else that I want to point out, if you can imagine, we ask for um, participants to register. There is no fee. 
But we ask for a registration because we keep the experience, which I'll describe a little bit further, to four or five partners because that accommodates our galleries well. It allows one-on-one -on -one conversation. But if you can imagine, or if you deal with memory loss in your daily life, you will understand that some days are really good days, and you didn't register for the program, but it's a really good day to go to the museum. Things are falling into place, and it's a great day. We have a commitment from our volunteers to double book. So we will have, on a day such as today, twice the number of volunteers that we anticipate needing. So anyone that walks through the door for that SPARK program will be a part of that SPARK program this morning, which is beautiful. And I, again, we are so fortunate in this community um, to have such support. That is exactly what played out this morning. We had two uh, partners registered, and we had a full house of five by the time the program began. And as the snow was at its heaviest and the roads were at its slickest, our participants arrived for this program. Last month, and sometimes um, I know some of you know me fairly well, and you know that I enjoy hyperbole. And if you know director Kathy Foley, Kathy Foley does not like hyperbole. So she tries to tone me down a little bit. So sometimes it sounds a little hyperbolic, but these um, situations actually occurred. Last month we had, and this was during that very wicked snowstorm, we were going to cancel the program, but we couldn't cancel the program for the re very reasons I said. Someone may have been working for two or three hours to get to the museum. Our volunteers walked up the hill because Franklin Hill was impassable at that time, came up the hill, came a half an hour early, and then waited because we had heard from a brand new participant, had never been to the Woodson Art Museum, and they had called an hour earlier and said they were coming. We couldn't imagine that this was going to happen. The program begins at 10.30. No one. Our volunteers wait. Now they have been there a half an hour already, and 15 minutes later, a wife and her husband come through the door and the wife looked at us and said, I can't believe we're here, but he said, I want to go to the museum. That is an amazing story. They were back again this morning, driving in the snow again to come to the museum. It is about joy. That is what we try to bring to the museum through our SPARK program. One, uh, Okay, here's my complaint. Never complain, never explain. One of the things that I find a little bit challenging about the title Spark, I know where the, the sort of the genesis of the, of the title comes from, but I think sometimes it's misinterpreted that you're going to be in the galleries and we're going to spark a memory. And that's not what we're going for. It's about creativity, it's about improvisation, it's about being in the moment. So as I present more about the program, I just want you to keep in mind that we're not, it's not about um, jarring a memory loose. Does it happen? Yes. We had um, a gentleman come with his mother and actually uh, left in tears of joy um, and said that mom had been nonverbal for several years and in the galleries, she began to recite nursery rhymes because that's what we were presenting that morning was a nursery rhyme that connected with one of the art, uh, with one of the paintings. And he said, my mom was an elementary school teacher and she knew all of the nursery rhymes and, and the poetry um, from early childhood education. And this was, he hadn't heard her voice in a very long time. So those beautiful moments occur and they're wonderful when they happen, but we're not concerned about accurate memories bubbling up to the top. We're concerned about creativity and having fun in the galleries. I also want to make one statement. So earlier I presented on um, the work of Dr. Lucan and Oma. Her work is on those with advanced Alzheimer's. 
The SPARC program is for those in the early stages of memory loss. So there, that is a clear distinction that we need to make on who we um, serve. SPARC, for individuals with memory loss and their care partners. And earlier I had mentioned the stressors on care partners and uh, caregivers. And one of the great insights of the SPARC program is that it is also for the care partners. It is not a drop-off program. You are at to attend together and experience um, the morning together. When we do the hands-on art project, and again I'll explain that a little further in a moment, uh, we set out and prepare for everyone, for the care partners as well as um, the participants. We are very cognizant that this is not an observer because unfortunately most of um, the experience, for instance, in a long-term care facility, there's a lot of observation going on. We want this to be participation. So we make sure that we um, are very conscious of eliminating that observation component and make sure it's um, participation. Spark. Social engagement in the galleries. Our staff photographer, Rick Wunsch, captured this one and it's just a beautiful moment. There is, I, I don't need to explain anything further about this moment. It's absolutely beautiful. Lifelong friends and neighbors sharing art together. So there's social engagement in the galleries. The experience is scheduled for about an hour and a half. Again, if you think about um, whom we are serving, about 15 minutes is transition, welcome, etc. Um, but then approximately an hour is spent in the galleries. And as part of that, we bring in as many, in the business we call them tactiles, they're props, hands-on materials that help with connections to the artwork that's there. This was one of my uh, favorite experiences. We had this lovely woman and she had an expression on her face and was wearing what appeared to be a fur uh, coat and she had a string of pearls on. And so for this experience, we had hats. We had um, someone loaned us a fur stole to use. So bringing in that tactile, manipulative touch that could be shared and make the connection to the artwork. We had a necklace, um, so various things to, uh, again, make that artwork come alive. And also as part of this, there is hands-on art making. And in the art making, we um, make sure that we have adaptive supplies. We are conscious of contrast of light and dark, the volume of light that's in the room. Sometimes we need more, sometimes we need less. So we try to be um, cognizant of that. And um, what we are learning, and partly from the work of this Dr. Lucan at Miami University, is actually some of the more successful projects are abstract art, enjoying the abstraction. So we're um, focusing our projects more on the abstraction as well. And we have what we call at the Woodson Art Museum high success projects. So someone like myself can have great success with these projects, but then we also make sure that we have sophisticated art materials there as well because we have participants with a broad range of talents and experiences. We had a gentleman um, attend and we had drawing materials out and he was um, drawn, excuse the pun, drawn to um, some of the straight edges that we had there. And through conversation, we learned that he was um, an architect. And we made sure that each time that he came to the art museum, rather than engaging in the prescribed art project for that day, we made sure he had um, drafting tools and drawing tools out so he could um, enjoy his experience. So at the uh, Woodson Art Museum, the way we've developed our program is there's time in the galleries, and that time in the galleries will include music of some sort. 
It will include engagement with typically three or four artworks. Um, again, we're traveling through the galleries, so that's a, that's a manageable amount of um, artworks to focus on. And again, the recognition is that our participants are adults who have led full lives. And so when I uh, develop the experience, I develop it at a level that I would present here. And then as um, the volunteers are leading the experience, they will meet the group where they're at, where there's interest, where there isn't interest, and just flex as we're going through. So again, that improvisation. So in the galleries, there's a music component. There is interaction and engagement with the artwork. There is something called um, a time slip story, which I'll explain in a moment. And then at the end, it always wraps up with hands-on art. And again, this is for the care partners as well. And Christine, I'm just going to keep going if you're comfortable with that. OK. And the joy. And that's what we go for is the joy. Again, I'm staff lead, but I want to point out that these experiences um, that occur at the Art Museum, we have 16 full-time equivalent staff. And I would say roughly a quarter on any spark day are directly involved in delivering this program, whether it's making sure that the facilities are ready or um, at visitor services, they word process the stories that we create so that at the end of the experience, they walk out, the participants walk out the door with um, the word process piece. So this is an, an uh, many staff are behind um, delivering this program. But what I do, and again, this observation piece, I try to sneak in the gallery so I'm not noticed and I don't interrupt and, and listen to what goes on. And I feel we have delivered a beautiful spark program when I hear the raucous laughter. And there is always raucous laughter at some point in the morning. And that is um, when I feel we have success. So see? I did bring the brightness and the luminescence to a subject that is, is very difficult. The stories that we create, and this is the particular slide that is very difficult to read, is based on the work of Ann Davis Basting out of UW-Milwaukee. She is a gerontologist working as a professor of theater at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee Peck School of Arts. And she was the 2016 MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant recipient. So she has some bona fides uh, as well. And she created a program called Time Slips. And again, I do not want to shortchange um, what her program is. The program that she developed would be delivered over an hour, an hour and a half, and it's creative storytelling. So the entire experience is creative storytelling. But we at the Woodson Art Museum have borrowed from that. And the creative storytelling that we do um, takes place over about 15 minutes time. And this goes back to where I mentioned earlier that Spark as a program is not about sparking accurate memories. It's about creativity and improvisation. So we do creative storytelling. This was a piece um, that was in the galleries in 2017, Birds and Art, by Jan McAllister Stamas, called Moving On. And the uh, story that was developed, uh, and I'll explain the prompts in a minute, the story that was developed from this piece was lunchtime. Lake Michigan or faraway shores? So tranquil. Time to let go and reflect. Let's take off our shoes and fill the fishing boat with food, and of course, life jackets. We'll sit and wait for the tide to take us out and just enjoy the day. So when participants and care partners leave, they will each have um, a word processed copy of that story. It references, I'm sorry, I talked to you about my vision. I keep, I don't see this. I apologize for that. Um, they will leave with a word processed version of the story. It will reference the artwork. At the bottom, it says the Woodson Art Museum and the date. It will be in a sans serif font, which means it doesn't have those fancy little um, serif 
uh, marks at the top so it's clear and legible and unlike my slides it will be in a large font it's usually 18 to 20 uh, point font and we have heard that um, for instance those that attend in a long-term care facility that this has hung on bulletin boards and has sparked conversation with loved ones that have come to visit um, you know, where were you and where did this occur and so forth and so on. So that's part of the reason that this goes home is to have a connection to this experience. I mentioned the program that happened that occurred this morning. And if you look in your brochure where it describes Spark, it will talk about the monthly program that occurs on the second Thursday of each month in the morning. Those are for care partners and those with memory loss. Um, we also offer an experience for those in long-term care facilities. They can schedule a tour, and it, it occurs in the same manner. Gallery time, music, story, hands-on art. The, they travel with staff from the long-term care facility who meet their care needs while they're in the galleries, and then we pair them with a spark friend. So a specially trained museum volunteer who is their surrogate care partner for the day. So again, the lead person can talk about um, maybe the medium in the painting or something, medium used in the painting, and then the spark friend will turn to the participant and then have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So we make sure there's one-on-one -on -one conversation that occurs. And one time I witnessed um, a long-term care facility attend and meet with um, our Spark friends, and the Spark friend and the participant began conversing in German, um, which was lovely. Um, so this is, that's what happens at the Woodson Art Museum. And I'm looking at the time. Christine um, suggested that we have a chance for Q&A, and I want to just go through real quickly, and so if you have questions, please interject, and I had hopes that we would sort of develop a program together, but perhaps we will have a few minutes to do just that. This is one of my favorites because um, it's quite illustrative of what I feel this program brings to um, the museum, to the community, to the participants. This is a beautiful piece. Uh, again, this happens to be a Wisconsin artist that was in um, Birds and Art, S.V. Medeiros. And this was, boy, I don't know, Rudy, do you remember? This is about six, was it seven feet? Was it as tall as seven feet? It was a massive print. It was huge. And it was called Chicken Pot Pie. So this was an easy one to incorporate into Spark. And this is the storytelling piece. So you can see um, the clouds appear to be chicken pot pies. You see this chicken coming at you. So there was a lot of discussion about, you know, um, is that chicken in the pot pie? You know, it, you can imagine where the conversation went. But then when it came to the creative storytelling, this is the difference between creative improvisational storytelling and what you might think of as traditional storytelling. When you have the group gathered, instead of saying, what did you put in your chicken pot pie? Or what did mom put in the chicken pot pie when you were growing up? That's asking somebody to pull on an actual memory. And it's focusing on facts. Instead, we say, let's make a chicken pot pie. What are we going to put in that chicken pot pie? So whatever bubbles up is just fine. It doesn't matter what we put in our chicken pot pie because we're just creating a story. What I love about this, and the scribe that day, the volunteer scribe, happens to be a former Ella elementary education, excuse me, elementary principal. And she was able to translate what had gone on and, and put it into some beautiful verse. Um, which actually I'm just going to skip by right now. But what also occurred with this is a discussion of a particular restaurant in town that serves a mean chicken pot pie. And I think we all probably know which restaurant this is. You get a percentage off on your birthday based on your age, that restaurant. And so there was a discussion of chicken pot pie. Spark wraps up at noon. And the participants left the Woodson Art Museum, and together, the care partners and the participants gathered at this restaurant and shared a meal. That then cascaded, and this particular group would meet for lunch 
after their SPARC experience. This is where the care partners gain their respite. When you walk in the Woodson Art Museum for the SPARC program, and you look at someone else who is a care partner for someone with memory loss, you don't have to explain anything. You don't have to explain, you don't have to translate, you just have that knowing look of understanding what um, the challenges are. And so that is a, a, a beautiful part of this program. And um, at this point, I think, Christine, should I, yes, open it up. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. Keeping me honest. So I had my images in here. We'll see how quickly we can go through. These are some sample stories. Some of the images. So my challenge is to find artworks that would lend themselves well to discussion in the galleries. Um, anything with atmosphere is a, a great challenge because you can talk about what do you hear, what do you smell, um, et cetera. And then music, we bring in a lot of music. And what I find interesting is second only to your childhood memories. If you wanted to take a guess, what, what period in your life do you most positively connect to the music? That's a convoluted statement. But it's typically when people were in their 30s. So if you figure we're dealing with a population in the early stages of memory loss, Probably, statistically speaking, we're talking 70 to 80 years of age. We need to reference m music from the 60s and the 70s. And I have a great volunteer who said to me, Lisa, we need more Leonard Skinner and Led Zeppelin in this program. And one of my favorite anecdotes, um, last year for Valentine's Day, we had the Pointer Sisters fire as part of the music. And we had one of our participants dancing in the entrance as she was leaving and singing the song, which was really cool. Um, anyway, so uh, I brought this one up, and I had my little uh, uh, example there. I was going to play. Uh, John Denver's Country Boy with that one. But I'm bringing us back to um, my butterfly. What is in the galleries right now is origami um, and through March 1st. And an incredible exhibition, again, free admission. And I spoke about the rocket scientists that will be here. We have um, another artist, Jing Mei Wu, you'll see in the calendar events. She will be here on the weekend of the 18th and 19th at the same time the snow sculpture is going on. We have a lot going on. And what is absolutely fascinating to me is how this all played out with good ideas. Um, back to the work of Eric Demain and Martin Demain. Eric Demain is a child prodigy. He never attended school until he went to university at age 12. He received his PhD when he was 20 and was the youngest faculty member at MIT at the ripe old age of 21. He's now 36. Um, his work, he works with his father, is in the galleries. It's called computational origami. They do something called crease curves. Um, just this incredible um, work. I like this piece, much like the earlier piece that I used that was called Together, and I liked um, the intersection of art and um, dementia and their piece called Together. This one's called Green Recycling, and what they're portraying in here is that destruction is a form of creation. And when you talk about um, you know, the destruction of the healthy memory process and then the creation that goes on in the galleries with our SPARK program, I really liked that play. But what is important about this work is Eric Demain is um, a PhD, also known throughout the world for his origami. And this is where our butterfly comes in. When origami meets rocket science, and this is just a little snippet on the work of Eric D. Demain, professor of computer science at MIT. Demain is researching the microbiological applications of origami. One uh, application that we're all aware of that is not his work is the heart stent. The heart stent was inspired by origami folds. The microbiological applications of origami. He suspects that the principles that govern origami might also dictate how protein molecules fold in our bodies, a process that, 
when it goes wrong, has been linked to illnesses such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. They are studying the protein tangles in the brain and how to reverse that or prevent it or affect it through origami and what origami folds can teach them about how those proteins tangle in the brain. Absolutely fascinating. So again, Spark at the Woodson Art Museum. We had that joy this morning. We are volunteer driven. We can't exist without the community support. Our admission free, barrier free museum that sets the standard internationally for avian art, who is progressive about barrier free and brings the joy of two best friends to our galleries. Thank you very much. Any questions?